Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to Plants in Silico a workshop and symposium. So, and uh, also to our out-of-town guests, welcome to the University of Illinois and the National Center for Supercomputer Applications. Um, the meeting and this evening's lecture have been made possible by the Olga G. Naubandov Lecture Fund. Um, Andrew and Olga Naubandov were both highly regarded researchers in reproductive physiology. Um, they, between them, they put in 60 years of work at the University of Illinois. And Olga was also an alum. She obtained a PhD in chemistry in 1946. And the fund is part of the legacy that they left to the university, which allows at least one of these symposia every year. So I should also mention that many units on campus have also contributed generously to make this symposium and workshop possible. And we're also grateful to the National Center for Supercomputer Applications for hosting us. So um, I should also mention that the Institute um, for Sustainability, Energy and Environment, whose director's here, Evan DeLucia, has really funded this initiative on, on campus. So we're very grateful to you, Evan, and your team. Um, the objective of the symposium and integrated workshop, though, is to reimagine modeling of plants. Um, how can we move from many isolated modeling activities that we have in the plant sciences community across the world into an integrated whole where the whole community can really join up and achieve something which is, is much bigger than the sum of the parts? Um, and I think we're, we're, our goal over these two days and this evening is to really think about this. How can we achieve this? What do we need? What do we really want from this? And at the end of it, we want to really have a white paper to sort of guide a way forward, a, if you like, a sustainable way forward that people can buy into and can really see this taking us further. And of course, you might say, well, you know, why, why do we need this? And, you know, I think if we only have to really look at the situation with now what is possible with computing tools and perhaps what we're not doing in the plant science community, you know, really building models, for example, of plants which incorporate the sum of most of our knowledge of how they actually function, joining up the levels from molecular right the way through to whole plants and communities of plants. Being able to use those models so that we can, if you like, invert them and then predict what is the idiotype we need to maximize productivity or to maximize sustainability? And how can we really integrate the body of plant science knowledge into global models so that we can get a much better prediction of how the global ecosystems are going to change and their feedbacks. Keeping in mind that the world as we know it today, the atmosphere as we know it today, is a result of what plants have actually uh, conducted. So, of course, in, in moving forward, we looked at other communities. You know, what have they achieved? And we're very lucky this evening to be able to hear about the, the virtual rat. And I'm going to hand over to my co-conspirator, um, Amy Marshall Colan, to introduce this evening's speaker. Hi, thank you all for coming. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Dan Beard. He is the Carl J. Wiggers Collegiate Professor of Cardiovascular Physiology, and he's at the University of Michigan Medical School. He's housed in the Department of Molecular and Integrative Physiology, but he also has affiliate appointments in biomedical engineering and emergency medicine. So Dr. Beard was a Barry M. Goldwater Scholar at Boston University, and this is where he earned his BS in biomedical engineering. He then earned an MS in applied mathematics and a PhD in bioengineering under the supervision of Dr. James Bassingthwaite at the University of Washington. 
He was then an HHMI postdoctoral fellow at the Courant Institute at New York University before holding academic positions at the Medical College of Wisconsin and now at Michigan. Uh, Dr. Beard is a fellow of the American Physiological Society in the cardiovascular section, and he has authored over 100 peer-reviewed publications, two textbooks, and has one of the top 10 cited papers in the Journal of Theoretical Biology. In total, um, his work has over 42,000 citations. Uh, sorry, 4,200 citations. I'm sure it'll be 42,000 before too long. <laughs> uh, he's currently the director of the Virtual Physiological Rat Project, and this is supported as an NIH National Center for Systems Biology, uh, working to analyze, interpret, simulate, and ultimately predict the physiological function in health and disease. So it is the pioneering work of Dr. Beard and his colleagues through the Virtual Physiological Rat Project that serve as an inspiration for uh, plants in silico. And we are just delighted that he's here with us tonight as our keynote speaker. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Beard. Thanks, Amy. Thank you very much for the really nice introduction and for the opportunity to be here. So, the stuff you're talking about is, is exactly what we're trying to do. And, and, I'm, and, and linking, the, linking up the scales, linking up the pieces, putting Humpty Dumpty back together again. And so I'm not here to tell you how to do it because we're in process of trying. But, but I think there's, you're going to see, I hope, a lot of commonalities, maybe even some, certainly, uh, cer certainly some themes and some, some and, but maybe also some specifics and some specific tools and, and some specific approaches that may be useful. So, you know, we're interested in, in cardiovascular physiology in silico, not plants in silico. But, you know, I think a lot of, like I said, a lot of the techniques, a lot of the tools, a lot of the thinking translates. Um, and, and like Amy said, so we've been supported for the past five years as a National Center for Systems Biology, so that really helped us get, get ourselves off the ground. We, we've, We've built the Virtual Physiological Rat Project as a, um, with, with, with a focus on, on the basic science side, on hypertension and hypertensive diseases, hypertensive heart disease. And what we're trying to do, kind of maybe what we're thinking of phase two, we've done a lot of basic science and a lot of modeling and simulation work, now trying to translate some of that knowledge into having an impact in the clinic. And that's, a, that's a little more slow going and a little more difficult, but, but we're getting there. So th this is a diagram from a grant proposal, okay? And this, this is a diagram that tries to illustrate at a very high level what some of the thinking is around hypertension, okay? And hypertension, I'm not talking to a bunch of physiologists, but most people know what hypertension is. Hypertension means your blood pressure is too high, okay? Or it's, or it's, it's higher than you want it to be. And actually, hypertension is really bad. Um, it turns out, according to the World Health Organization, it's the worst thing you can have. Okay, it's the number one predictor of mortality and morbidity worldwide. And so that's kind of a, that's a true statement statistically, but it's also one of these statistical lies because hypertension is something that we're all getting as we age and we all die. So therefore, there's a pretty good correlation between hypertension and, and, and mortality. But still, you don't want to be hypertensive, and if you are hypertensive, do something about it. Um, so there's, there's a lot of ideas about why people become hypertensive, and a hypothesis we've developed is that it has to do with, with, with stiffening of, of your, your blood vessels. And as you age, um, you, you get a remodeling, mostly you get an overexpression of collagen and, and, a, and a loss of elastin, and the blood vessels become stiffer. And in a lot of your large arteries, you have um, uh, specific receptors which in response to stretch, send signals to the autonomic system, and this is part of what's called the barrow reflex system. And so as vessels get stiffer, it requires a bigger and bigger pressure change in order to elicit the same kind of feedback response. And so we call that the mechanogenic hypothesis. Now, there's a lot of other ideas about what are the underlying causes of hypertension, and that's what I'm trying to illustrate here is that you really can't you have to think about this in, in some sort of integrated system sense. And one of the important ideas is that there's an autonomic or nervous system uh, etiology to hypertension. And the reason why it's difficult to unpack, say, the mechanical etiology with, the, with the, um, an, an, an autonomic etiology is because 
you know, the mechanical ideology leads to the autonomic ideology and vice versa. Um, as you become, if you make an animal hypertensive with a surgical model or with a, with a drug, then vessels become stiffer as a, as a remodeling response to the increase in pressure. So all of these things sort of interact with one another. And so we have to think about systems. And this is, this is a systems picture where I'm showing an integrative systems at kind of a, a, a given level, right? I'm going to talk about trying to go across different scales and different levels. I want to point out from the very beginning that, that the, the VPR, the virtual rat, is a big program. It's a, it's a um, multi-institutional, multi-laboratory, collaborative research network. And there's a lot of folks, and I'm not going to name everybody's name, that have, have contributed to this. But I'm going to give you a little bit of a history of the thinking that went into trying to put this project together and then give you some very small examples of specific examples of how we, what, what you can do when you try to put these pieces together. So we, we, we devised the idea of a virtual physiological rat in the context of what's called the Physiome Project. And maybe you've heard of the Physiome Project. Has anybody heard of the Physiome Project? Okay, so maybe, maybe a third of the people here. So the Physiome Project is not exactly a concrete thing. You can't point to it and say, those people are the Physiome Project. It's more of a lightning rod or a rallying cry for trying to integrate systems in the same way we've already started talking, you know, um, across scales, in space, in time, organ systems. I think, you know, um, let, well, let me just read off of this slide here. The physiome is a description of an organism's functional behavior. We really think about mammals in, in, in particular. Um, it describes the physical dynamics of the normal intact organism and is a built upon information and structure genome protein morphome. I think this is an incredibly difficult task to put the physiome together. And it's not a task that has an endpoint. We're never going to be done with it. It's not like the genome project, right? But, um, but compared to plants, I think it's really, really easy. I mean, I hate to tell you that, right? I've looked a little bit at, I started looking at plant metabolism, and I just said, I don't want to look at plant metabolism anymore. And that's just, you know, it, it, plants can do a heck of a lot more than we can do, right? And I guess that's a good thing. Um, anyhow, so, so where does the idea of a physiome come from? So physiome was, was, was not a response, but more a, uh, a synergistic idea that evolved with the genome project. And so if we look back, and this is almost 20 years ago where we, this, this White House press release announced the completion of the Human Genome Project, I think it was a little bit naive about what this was going to do for us, right? We, 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 we certainly have um, not... At, 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 the, at the level of simplicity that, that, that the, um, you know, the outcomes of, uh, the potential outcomes or the potential payoffs of the Human Genome Project were communicated, say, to the taxpayers, we haven't really achieved this, these kind of payoffs yet, and it's turned out to be a lot more complicated than, than we thought it would be. One of the reasons for that is that, at least in mammals, there's a lot less genes than we thought there were. Right? There's really hardly that many genes. There's, there's more parts on the airplane that I flew here this afternoon than there are genes, okay? But it, in, in, in the human genome. And so the idea that the genome is the parts list and all we have to do is put the parts together doesn't fly. It's much more complicated than that. We're obviously a human being. It's much more sophisticated and complicated than an airplane. It means that there are many, many, many more functions than there are genes, but it also means that there are many, 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 many genes associated with any given function. And if you think about something like blood pressure or hypertension, probably more genes, probably the majority of genes have some kind of a direct or indirect influence on that at the level of organization of the uh, whole physiological function. Okay, so where did this idea of a physiome project come from? And you heard that my PhD advisor was Jim Bassingthwaite. So Jim is one of the pioneers or visionaries of, of the Physiome Project. Jim is a, a physician. He was a, he's a cardiologist. And when he was at Mayo Clinic in the 70s, he was taking pictures of the, the coronary circulation. So this is a heart. It's a heart of a dog. And the coronaries are the, are the are, coronary arteries are the vessels that sort of sit on the surface of the heart. It's called a coronary circulation because it's like a crown or a corona on the surface of the heart. Okay, and then, by the way, as you know, 
plants have vasculars too. And I thought, geez, this kind of looks a little bit like a, like a, a, a plant. And this is some kind of milkweed that I got off, off of the internet. Um, if you go deeper, um, the, the, the microvasculature becomes organized in parallel strands, okay, in parallel to the muscle fibers in the myocardium. And Jim was one of the first people to start putting together models of um, microvascular transport and exchange that were built like bioreactors, okay, and using the, the technology of um, and in, 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 the, in the tools and the mathematics of chemical engineering to, to understand, say, cardiac, to build models of cardiac metabolism and then to build models in order to simulate the kinds of experiments you can do. And Jim also pioneered a, what's called the multiple indicator dilution method where you put different indicators into, you, you have an intravascular indicator and then you have other extravascular indicators and you have indicators that then react and these are labeled with either optical Trace or radioactive tracers or optical markers, so then you can watch how they wash out of the organ, and then you can try to simulate the, the, the underlying kinetics, fit the data, and then identify something about the underlying um, um, energy metabolism in the myocardium. But Jim also introduced this term, physiome, or he introduced, he called it in the, in the first sort of um, uh, you know, opinion piece on this, the physiognome, okay? Now, what Jim said was that the physiognome is a description of the physiological dynamics of the normal intact organism. Um, modeling is a vehicle for combining information from molecular biology, biophysics, and, and medical biology. So this is exactly what you're talking about doing. This is 20 years ago. And, you know, I think that um, the ideas were out there, but we didn't necessarily know how to do it all. Uh, um, Next one, so, so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about not just Jim, but some of the other sort of visionaries of, of this physiome concept in, in, in physiological modeling. And so the other visionary is, is Peter Hunter. And Peter uh, is, is most famous for building models of the beating heart, the mechanics of the heart, okay, using finite elements. But those mechanics models also combine models for... Um, uh, um, the spread of electrical excitation on the surface of the heart. So, you know, for those of you that are engineers in here, in order to put together a simulation of the heart that can account for electrical activation, that's a, that's a hyperbolic problem, okay? And then for um, blood flow inside the ventricle, well, that's an average Stokes kind of, kind of fluid problem. And then the mechanics, what, what Peter pioneered was um, anatomically realistic models of the heart with with deformable high, high um, resolution or, or high dimension, uh, high order of, um, um, deformable finite elements. And then it, what they've gone on, what, what they've done more recently is now try to merge that with looking at the coronary vasculature. So there's those vessels again surrounding just, just the left ventricle, which is one of the cavities of the heart. Now Peter, just like Jim, started with structure. Okay, so Peter, when Jim was looking at, was taking pictures of the coronary vasculature in Minnesota, Peter was at Oxford, and this is the rig, a, a picture of Peter in a lab, where um, he built a rig for, for, for measuring the direction of all the fibers of, of the myocardium. And he would peel the myocardium like an onion and get the next layer, the next layer, the next layer. And it's really a beautiful kind of thing because, you know, the, 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 the fibers shorten maybe 10%. And they shorten 10% in order to eject 50% or even 60 or 70% of the blood. And how do they do that? Well, you have these sort of successive layers of, of difference. So you sort of, it's hard for me to do with my hands, but you, you maybe get a 10% shortening this way and then a 10% shortening this way. And you, when you sort of multiply all those together, you can then eject the cavity. So the point is, we needed, Peter needed the structure in order to be able to start building some of these very first models of the heart. Peter did his, um, oh, so, so then, so Peter, organized IUPS physiome project as a real entity instead of just a, an airy-fairy idea. And IUPS is, is the International Union of Physiological Sciences. So it's a, it's a society or actually an umbrella society organization. And along with Jim, organized some of the early meetings of trying to get people together, meetings like this, and said, Let's, we have to do something, right? How can we, how can we get organized? Peter did his, his PhD work 
with Dennis Noble. And Dennis built the first model of the cardiac action potential. Okay? And Dennis built, the, built that in the framework of the Hodgkin-Huxley model. Hodgkin-Huxley, if you guys hang around with neurophysiologists, you'll have heard of Hodgkin and Huxley before. Hodgkin and Huxley are kind of the patron saints of computational physiology. Um, and, and if you want to look at this 1952 paper, it's an absolute work of art. And it's one of the only computational modeling papers that you can actually sit down in an afternoon and rebuild their simulations of the action potential of the, the squid neuron. Okay, so this is a simulation. This is a, a, a measurement from the Atlantic squid axon. Who's heard of Hodgkin and Huxley? Just out of curiosity. So people have heard of, heard of these people. And Andrew Huxley, by the way, this is, the, the, Andrew Huxley is of, of that, of those Huxleys, okay? So Andrew's great something, great, great grandfather or something was, was Thomas Henry. So this is a, a family of royalty right, in science. Okay so, um, okay, so here we are. We want to put this thing together. And you know, in order to do this, we're integrating across domains. We're combining domains, right? Because there's chemical domains, mechanical, electrical, right? There's space domains going from, from subcellular processes up to the organism. And there's time domains, right? And, and you know, when we model, even going back to you know, um, this, this action potential and this depolarization event, this happens in, 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 in milli, on a millisecond time scale. And if you're looking at a mouse heart or a rat heart, it's even faster, right? And so, um, but of course, we're interested in all, all the way up to the human time scale or the lifetime kind of time scale. So we have huge time scale, range, range of time scales that we're interested in. A um, little more history. So, the, we, we, we've sort of had this series of meetings on the cardiac physio that have been organized mostly by Peter and also by Nick Smith, who's now at Auckland, and Andrew McCulloch, who's at UCSD. And these meetings are probably about the size of this one, especially the earlier ones. And these were sort of, we, 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 I, I don't know what the first one was called. I wasn't at the first one. But at some point along the way, we started calling these meetings the cardiac physio meeting. And there's a bunch of people interested in modeling and simulating, simulating the heart. And um, at some point, I think it was in San Diego, we decided to call ourselves the Cardiac Physiome Society. And we called ourselves that because we wanted to have some thing to hang our hat on and we wanted to have a bank account. But it, it's nothing more than that. Um, and so the next meeting, by the way, is in, is, is in Korea. And the meeting after that is going to be in, in Toronto. It was around this meeting, organized by Nick, that we were finalizing our second revision, our first revision, second version of our P50 National Center grant, and which was then finally funded in, in, in 2011. We were probably 2008, 2007, we were already talking about this and putting it together. So, you know, this is a decade of my life at this point. Right, the VPR, and so, but this is exactly what you know—the kind of meeting that, that that we have over the next two days. There's actually sort of meetings we're putting together here. Um, so, so that led to the, to the VPR. Okay, so I'm gonna not too much more history, but I've told you about all these people, and I just want to point out one kind of inter at least interesting to me point. You already heard that, that that Jim was my PhD advisor, but there's all these family trees here. Okay. Two family trees involved here, and and um, all of these folks are involved in the VPR. Even Dennis, who is retired, so not actively involved as a, as, as a researcher, but everybody else is a participant, and 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 um, and and that's a strength and it's a weakness of having such a broad-based thing because everybody we've got people in different countries, obviously different institutions. How do we work together? We can talk about that. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about a, a little bit of science, okay? Um, because I want to give you an example of how we put things together and what, why it's valuable and what we can learn by putting things together, okay, trying to integrate these systems. And so I want to talk about heart failure. And what happens in heart failure is um, the, it, the heart is failing. The heart is, is, is mechanically unable to pump as well as it ought to be able to. And as a result, um, you know, the heart's a pump. The circulation is a closed-loop circulatory system. So if the pump's not working so well, 
you get a buildup at the input, at the inlet. Okay? And when you get a buildup at the inlet, you get what's called congestion. So people have probably heard of congestive heart failure, congestive heart disease. And so, so the input to the left side of the heart is the lungs. And if the lungs are the venous circulation is sort of filling up in the venous side, then you get edema and you get swelling and you get coughing and you get and you have an inability to, to exercise and you might get a, you might get swelling in your ankles. Uh, and, and and what's happening and, and then because you have blood volume regulation is, is, is at play, the kidneys involved, the endocrine system is involved, the autonomic system is involved, involved, and we'll see how, at least through some simulations, and obviously the heart and the circulation, so this puts everything together. So there's this understanding that metabolism is altered in heart failure. Okay, and, and there's this concept that the heart is energy starved. And what is energy? Energy is ATP or ATP hydrolysis potential is the free energy for cells to do things. Okay, so, so what is the heart doing? The heart is a pump, it's a muscle, right? Now, this is something that, that, that we can do that plants can't do. So plants can do a lot of things we can't do, but one of the things we can do is we can get up and, and run around, right? And the reason is because we have muscles, and the way muscles work is you have this organized structure of, of proteins which are organized in parallel to one another. And because of what's called, cross, we call it the cross bridge, you have one kind of protein that, that we, given the right signal, which is calcium, can stick to this other protein and then sort of ratchet it along. Okay, it's a really kind of simple idea of, of the sliding filament theory and how muscle can contract, okay? Just doing this. Most people have heard this before. The, the thing that drives muscle contraction is ATP. And most of the ATP, especially in the heart, is synthesized by mitochondria. Okay? And if you look at a cardiomyocyte, it doesn't really, it kind of looks like this. Okay? This is a skeletal muscle. But if you look at a heart muscle, what's missing from this picture is that you've got tons and tons of these mitochondria packed in there. Okay? And the heart, your heart, is about a third mitochondria. Okay, which is an, uh, unbelievable, because the rest of it are these proteins, these myofibrils. Okay? And so the heart has way more mitochondria than any other muscle, and that's because the heart is always working, and it really can't get fatigued. It can't get tired. Okay? It, never, it never takes a rest. It never goes to sleep. Okay? And so it's got a lot of mitochondria. All right? And I guess the reason why mitochondria, we have mitochondria is thanks to plants, right? because mitochondria wouldn't do as much good without plants, right? Okay, I'm trying to make these connections. Okay, but plants have mitochondria, right? Right, so it's, we, we, the, the, mitochondria is sort of the sister or the, the cousin of the chloroplast. Right? It's too bad we don't have chloroplast because that seems like a bit raw deal. Anyhow, so you know the mitochondria have this, have this respiratory chain, and the respiratory chain ends with... Um, reducing oxygen to water, okay? And um, along the way, it, it, it sets up a, a, a proton motive force, an electrostatic gradient across the membrane, and that electrostatic gradient is what drives the ATP synthase, okay? It synthesizes ATP. So ATP gets hydrolyzed to do things like contract, and that means ATP gets turned into ADP plus inorganic phosphate, and then it has to get resynthesized, right? So going back, to the ancient days of um, uh, trying to understand how mitochondria work, folks like Britain Chance were putting mitochondria inside respirometers. And you could measure the rate of ATP synthesis by measuring the rate of oxygen consumption. And in, in these kinds of experiments, and it's interesting, they did these experiments on mitochondria from liver. And that's because it's really easy to grind it up and, 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 and get a lot of mitochondria. Um, they, 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 made the prediction from these in vitro experiments that ADP controls the respiration rate. Okay, so it makes sense. So ADP, which is the hydrolysis product, it is the synthesis substrate. Okay, so it's a real simple kind of feedback process. And then it was 30 years later where they had the, the nuclear magnetic resonance um, technology where they could start, and this, these are data from human beings, probably from Britain Chance himself, where he put his arm in a, in a narrow bore magnet and you can measure the phosphate metabolites in vivo. And it turned out, lo and behold, 
it's the same thing. And the, and the, the ADP control model explain the in, in, in vitro data. And so a really simple in vitro idea and something that was identified in vitro translated directly to in vivo. Around the same time, people were looking at the heart and they said, oh, that doesn't work in the heart. Okay, and the heart, it's, it's messier um, because you can't put a surface coil right on the heart because, you know, it's inside the chest cavity and it's moving. Okay, so it's hard to sort of get, you have to sort of really you know, register your, your, um, your acquisition with the, the moving heart. And, and the heart is, you have some little very small, say it's a dog or a pig model, you've got a relatively narrow free wall of the left ventricle and right next to that is blood, a lot of blood and blood just, just really pollutes the signal. So given the fact that the data are a lot noisier, it was concluded that that model, the in vitro model, doesn't work at all, and we have no idea what's going on in vivo, and, it, and the predictions of the feedback model don't work, okay? And this was based on these observations that were made in, in, in 1986 and a couple of follow-up papers. Okay. So physicists know that, you know, Data don't mean anything without a theory, right? Now, if you say this to a biologist, they think you're joking, right? You know, theories are, you know, but anyhow, but it's true. It's absolutely true, and it should be true for biology. And we kind of stupidly say, well, let's make a theory. Let's make it, not, not a theory in some high-minded sense, but a theory in a model that has a bunch of kinetic expressions that can simulate the data, okay? So we do lots of experiments with isolated mitochondria, and mitochondria are great because you can interrogate with a lot of the features of the respiratory chain with optical methods. And um, so you can get at NADH redox, you can get at cytochrome redox, which is one of these intermediates, and you can get a membrane potential, and you can, we, we titrate in, ah, another connection to plants. We titrate in, titrate in an enzyme called potato apiarase, and that's just to hydrolyze ATP, okay? And so it's just to put different loads on the, on the, in, on the mitochondria in, in vitro. And we can map out these, um, these state variables, and we can use that to then build models. We build those models, and we can then start to try to predict what happens in, in vitro. And if we look at this particular experiment, I'm sorry, in vivo, and this is an experiment that we asked uh, Jay Zhang at University of Minnesota to do. So these are really require a lot of specialized equipment like MRI magnets. Um, but we said, Jay, can you, can you um, occlude one of those coronary arteries and then release it. And so these are steady state data, but down here the dynamic data are more interesting. So what happens is this, is, this is not a model, this is just the data that we used to drive the model. So what happens is flow goes down, and then when you release, release it, you have this physiological overshoot. It's called hyperemia, it's a fancy word. But then um, what happens to creatine phosphate is creatine phosphate goes down, inorganic phosphate goes up, and then, we, and then it recovers. Okay, fine. Well, this is our in vitro model without any parameter tweaking compared to the data. So it does really, really well. It almost does too well. Too good to be true kind of thing. So, so we have a quote unquote theory and, and really, the, really the model can be simplified and boiled down to that really simple feedback model of Britain chance. Okay, the big difference is that given some of these metabolite pool levels, the important controller is, is we predict is not ADP but it's inorganic phosphate. Inorganic phosphate changes. Now, we started looking at data from, from failing heart failure models, right? Because this is what we're supposed to be talking about is what's going on in heart failure. And I'm going to go through these details really, really quickly and just tell you that um, for individual animals that have what's called decompensated hypertrophy, varying stages of pr progress towards heart failure, um, m metabolite pools get altered, after they get depleted. And these are not mitochondrial metabolite pools, but these are the adenine nucleotide pools in the cytoplasm, the phosphate pool in the cytoplasm, and the total creatine, creatine plus, plus phosphocreatine. And as they get, to, and, and, if we, and if we just turn that dial on our model, based on what's independently measured for each individual animal, we can fit the data really, really well. And so we can explain this energy starvation, at least we can explain that the changes in the phosphate metabolites, the changes in ATP hydrolysis potential that happens as you progress through heart failure. So now we have a model of energetics 
normal energetics and failure. And we want to put that together with this thing, right? And so we had to build a model of the cross bridge. And models of the cross bridge cycle go back to there is again. Sir Andrew, okay? And he probably could have won another Nobel Prize for his sliding filament theory, but I don't think they give people two Nobel Prizes. Maybe they do. But um, not in medicine, in uh, physiology and medicine, right? So, um, so this, this is a kind of model of that process of cross bridges attaching, cross bridges ratcheting, cross bridges, bridges deattaching. And our model really looks a lot like the Huxley model. What's different about it is that we've got an extra state and we have an extra state because we had to explicitly put in the chemistry of the ATP hydrolysis because we want to be able to tie the kinetics of the cross bridge cycle to changes in the phosphate metabolites. And for those of you that are interested, um, there's, there's two interesting points here. One is that you can imagine there's been lots and lots and lots of models of the cross bridge cycle since 1957, right? But none of them put these things together in a way that we could use to tie it to the to the energetics. So when you say, oh, there's so much going on, say, in the plant world of modeling, and there probably is, but when you say, well, I want to, I want to build a model that puts these two things together, a lot of times you're going to say, well, I've got this model and I've got that model, but they really don't stick together in the way I want them to do, and I've got to build a new model anyhow. And we'll talk about some, some at least my thoughts on how to you know, overcome that. The other thing that's worth pointing out, just, just this looks like simple chemistry, chemical kinetics, right, with some state transitions, and it is, except this is a distributed model because there's an independent variable, which is strain. So this becomes a, a partial differential equation. So it becomes kind of a, a little bit, um, you know, not unwieldy, but it becomes more complicated computationally, you know, in terms of trying to do lots and lots and lots of simulations. Okay, so... We go through the process of identifying that model based on lots of data, which you can look at the, the published papers. This is a, an example of model validation. And we looked at an experiment done by uh, Kerry McDonald, where they do this kind of an experiment. They take a muscle, and they, they have it under tension. It's, it's permeabilized, which means that they can dump in a lot of calcium, and so it stays in tension. There's a lot of force. and um, then they just do what's called slack restretch. They just go boing, boing, like that. And what happens is tension goes down, and then tension comes back up. And there was a kind of strange result that people always got, and that is that as you increase phosphate level, inorganic phosphate, the force redevelopment is faster and faster. And that seems kind of weird because this is chemical kinetics, and phosphate is a product of this catalytic cycle. So as I increase the product concentration, why am I speeding up the cycle? That was kind of weird, right? And so we did the simulation experiment, and, we're not, and, and this is validation, so we're not trying to tweak parameters. And lo and behold, we get the exact same phenomenon. Not a perfect fit to it or a perfect match to it, but pretty darn close. And we went back and we looked at it, and now it seems kind of obvious what's happening, but it wasn't obvious until we had a model. And that is that what happens during the slack restretch experiment is... If the cross bridges are cycling really fast, they unattach and reattach, right? And in the limit where they never unattach and reattach, your muscle is just an elastic thing. It's an elastic solid. And the, and the force redevelopment is infinitely fast. So in other words, speeding up this recovery time has to do with slowing down the cross bridge cycle. And it all makes sense now that we put it all together. So that's fine. So we want to put these things together, right? So we want to put the energetics with the mechanics, and we want to see what happens, okay? And this is what, what uh, Dennis says, we have, is, is, is putting Humpty Dumpty back together again, and what I, I call putting the peanut butter with the chocolate, okay? And if you're old enough to remember this television commercial where somebody accidentally got their peanut butter and somebody's chocolate, and, and they said, hey, that's pretty good. So the point is, if we put the peanut butter and the chocolate, do we get something new? Do they work together in some new way? Or do we learn something? Do we make a Reese's peanut butter cup? Okay, so let's put the peanut butter with the chocolate. And, and so we're going to do it. It's not, it's not just those two things together, but imagine we have, I'm not telling you about the details, but a model of the heart. Okay, we have simple models of the heart, and we have complicated models of the heart. And we, we put one of these cardiomyocyte models inside the heart. And the cardiomyocyte model has 
calcium handling, and it, but, it, but it also has this R cross bridge model, right? And it has a mitochondrial model, right? And then, just to make it clear, these, all these, mo what underlines all these models are, say, models of complex one, models of the different transporters, the different, you know, ch enzyme channels, that sort of thing. So, in some sense, we're going from this, this kind of kinetic, Markov scale kind of model of the individual components up to the whole body. Okay, and so if we do that, and I'm showing you at time average kind of averaged over a window, so I'm not showing you the pulsatile dynamics of the system, so I'm just showing sort of average pressure, okay, arterial pressure, cardiac output, that's how much, uh, pumping of the heart, okay, and, and, and this is for a rat, not a human, by the way, so that's, that's how many mLs per second are coming out of the rat. Venous pressure, systemic venous pressure, sympathetic tone, angiotensin levels. And what happens, we're going to turn a switch. So this, we're not really modeling the remodeling process. We're not simulating what's going on. You know, development of heart failure in, in our rat model takes months. In humans, it takes years. But we're going to just turn the switch computation. We're going to turn on heart failure metabolism. And what happens to pressure, arterial pressure, is almost nothing. And the reason for that is because arterial pressure is really, really well regulated by a variety of feedback mechanisms, sympathy, the baroreflex, the renin angiotensin system, and other neurohumoral systems. Okay? And so the pressure doesn't really change, but cardiac output goes down. And eventually cardiac output recovers. And the reason cardiac output recovers is because you get this volume loading. Okay, you get this volume loading mostly through the kidney. Okay, and this is retention of, of retention of water, retention of volume. Okay, and you get, you know, hallelujah, lo and behold, you get congestion. Okay, just by doing this one thing. All right, um, and so what this impl what this t allows us to do is it allows us to you know, invoke a new hypothesis, and that is that there's a causal relationship from the energetic changes that happen in heart failure to mechanical changes to the whole body phenotype. And that's just a hypothesis because this is just a model, right? And so now we have to start looking at that and, and doing something with that hypothesis. So one thing we've been, we started, we looked at in this first paper we published on putting these things together, we looked at um, a drug. And there's a drug that's, that's going through a variety of clinical trials right now, which is a mass inactivator. There's a whole class of these drugs, but this is one that might actually make it to market. And what this drug apparently does is it somehow or another is associated with this particular step in the cross bridge cycle. So this is that same cycle again, going back to, you know, Sir Andrew Huxley, right? And um, we can now simulate the drug by changing that rate constant. Okay, and we have some idea from, from these data on isolated cells how, to, how much to change that rate constant for a given, a given um, dose. It's a little hand wavy, but you know, it, this is what people do in this field called quantitative systems pharmacology. Now, it, it, there's actually one big worry with this drug, and the big worry with this drug is that if you, you give it to normal animals or you give it to normal people, it increases oxygen utilization rate. And, it, and, and that, that makes sense because it's, so it's increasing cross bridge cycling. It's increasing cross bridge cycling without necessarily doing any more work. It's, it's reducing efficiency. So that's not too good if you have ischemic heart failure, maybe. Ischemia means not much blood supply, and you don't want to be consuming extra oxygen because you're going to become even more ischemic. Okay? So this drug might be bad news for a certain cohort of patients. All right? And... So we did these simulations of what happens to, this is that parameter, so this is no drug, this is with the drug. Like I said, it's rough, this is pretty rough um, translation from this, this particular parameter to a, um, you know, a two-fold change is kind of like what we think that, you know, in the, 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 what, what a therapeutic is, dose is doing. And what happens to work right in the model is nothing if you give the drug, but you're hydrolyzing more ATP, okay? And, there's, and then in a failure case, though, you get the same sort of effect, but, and this is a particular kind of failure, this is our energetic failure, right? So this, you know, there's lots of other things going on besides metabolism and heart failure, but in this energetic failure case, this is a simulation, you get a, a, 
uh, uh, commensurate increase in work along with that increase in ATP hydrolysis, okay? And there's a reason for that. The reason is that the, 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 the cross-bridge cycle is built to cycle at the right kind of rate, okay? There's a, one of these engineering trade-offs here, okay? And you can imagine all these little cross-bridges that are attaching and attaching, right? And, and, and they want to, some of them get a chance to ratchet and do some work, right? And if they're attaching and unattaching infinitely fast, they never get to do any work, right? So you have zero efficiency. But if they're unattaching, so, so you get the most efficient cross-bridge cycle is one that cycles infinitely slowly. Okay, well, that's not a very good one either because you're not going to be able to beat. The heart's not going to be able to beat, right? So there's some kind of a trade-off there, and, and, and you have this sort of optimal trade-off associated with the physiological state. Well, if you change the kinetics by changing the, the phosphate metabolites, you're no longer in that optimal state, but potentially a drug like this can push you back into that optimal state. We're also looking at drugs to, to um, try to actually rescue the energetic state rather than actually alter the, which is, you know, maybe going to be much more effective than trying to actually treat the, make the, 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 the mechanics directly. Okay, so, but we still have this, hy we still have this sort of hypothesis, right, that we have to try to um, test somehow. And, and one of the ways we're testing it is with collaboration with some cardiologists in the AMC, um, Academic Medical Center in Amsterdam, where uh, uh, folks have built this non-magnetic ergometer that you know you can slide a patient into the magnet and they can cycle okay and why is that important because then you can actually get different work rates and you can really perturb the model and this is this is an example of an experiment you can do in people that you can't do in animals because you can't train an animal to sit still in a magnet and cycle okay um, so all the animal data come from anesthesia, anesthetized animals, and so they, they be, you know, it's a whole other, other level of, of complexity. And of course, you, you don't want to just look at resting state. You want to be able to kick the system out of its resting state in order to get at dynamics and get at time-dependent changes and different work states. So we're almost there to getting different work states with the Amsterdam group. And then we're trying to bring this technology back to Michigan because actually Michigan is, is in the process of, we think, being... Um, the, one of the sites for the next big trial for, for this drug. And, and so it'd be fun to combine those efforts if, if we can. Um, and then what, the other thing we're doing in the clinic, kind of running out of time, so I'm just going to tell you very, very quickly that we're doing a lot of measurements on, on non-invasive measurements of cardiovascular dynamics in human subjects in order to build the cardiovascular um, um, part of the model, including baroreflex response and vascular mechanics and cardiac mechanics. And um, we're doing this in heart failure and hypertensive cohorts and hypertensive and with heart failure patient cohorts. But this is early days. And, you know, in, in the clinical side of things, it, it becomes very difficult. It, to, to, you, know, you can't control things the way you can control things in the laboratory, obviously. But, you know, ultimately this is where we want to go. Um, okay, so a few words about the physiome, and we can, I think, in the next couple of days, really talk about some of these practical matters. But one of the big practical matters that we're dealing with has to do with how do you put Humpty Dumpty back together again, right? So we've got lots of models, data sets, could be, could be, could be from animal models or could be from the clinic, right? We've got different parameter sets associated with different individuals or different species or different whatever, right? They, how do we, lots, different kinds of ways that models are instantiated and maybe Fortran or MATLAB or SBML or CellML, how are they simulated? Do you use, you know, um, some really complicated GPU code? that nobody else can read, or do you use MATLAB, you know, whatever. And so how do you put all this together, right? Um, I don't have the answer to that, except, you know, I can tell you from experience, you know, we can't build up new models of everything, but at the same time, you know, we can't just pick all the other models and glue them together and expect them to work. Um, one of the things that, that, you know, we try to do is we try to use standards. Okay, and, and you've heard of some of these standards like SBML, 
the standard that works best for us, or tends to work better for us, I shouldn't say best, is Cellamel. And Cellamel and SBML are in this process of, of, of kind of merging, or at least talking to each other. But Cellamel is constructed more for physiological kind of models, where SBML is maybe more for systems biology or um, um, you know, biochemical kind of models. And we try to use, you know, Open Core is an example of a, of, a, of a tool that we've been developing under VPR, or at least supporting under VPR, but it's also been being developed at, at Auckland, you know, with other, other resources. And Open Core is a model authoring and simulation engine which allows you to sort of transparently use, use these standards. Okay. So the standards are kind of clumsy and cumbersome sometimes, and there are certain things you can't do with the standards. And for example, our cross bridge model is a PDE, so, uh, so, so it can't be written down in CLML or SBML. So we can't use it, there is no standard, okay? So even if, no matter how much we want to be good citizens or try to work with these standards, we can't. Um, so we need to update the standards, right? Um, we, one of our teams, VPR, this is, this is most of these folks are at the University of Washington. Brian Carlson is at the University of Michigan, have been working on tools for annotating models in a controlled way. And in order to annotate models, you need the right kind of ontology. And so Dan Cook has been developing something called the Ontology of Physics for Biology. Okay? And this is an ontology that we use in combination with other kinds of more well-established ontologies, mostly one called FMA, Foundational Model of Anatomy. And, and, and we, 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 we annotate models in a, in a composite, with an, a composite annotation, which we use OPB annotations for something like fl a, a fluid pressure, and that fluid pressure then has to be put somewhere, and that's somewhere in the context of the anatomy, of the, of, of the FMA anatomy. So once we can then annotate models in a consistent way, then we can use some computer-aided reasoning to try to put them together or even pull them apart, okay? And so Max Neal has developed a tool called SEMGEN, and what SEMGEN does is somebody else's slide, so I'm going to be a little careful to try to go through it, but this is a nice paper if you want to look at it. What SEMGEN allows you to do is take these annotated models and glue them together, okay? And if you're running this, and, and, and Max has a really nice demo that I'm trying to get him to video and, and, and put on the web, it, it doesn't, it's not just press a button and you get the output. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a hum, it's computer aided human interface. And what it does is it will say you put together two models, like a, uh, 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 oxidative phosphorylation with ATP and, uh, um, you know, uh, the Crossbridge cycle. Okay, so hopefully you've annotated with Kebby ATP, right, in some way. So that in both models it says, oh, this is the same thing. Okay, but it may come up, it may have questions. It may say, well, you've got this variable here and this variable here. Are they the same? Should I make them the same? In one of them, it might be a constant in one, or a parameter. In another model, it might be a variable or something like that. And then I say, should we keep it a constant or should we make it a variable or what should we do? And then so variable by variable, with the, there, there's this user interface and it asks you questions. And then by your done, but when you're done, and then it makes a new model. Okay. The other thing that the tool does is it lets you then extract modules. Like if I wanted to go back to, well, I'm not going to find it, but say this big metabolic model, this cardiomyocyte model, I want to pull out just that enzyme or just this pathway. You can do that with this tool. And, and it's not perfect. And again, and it's a, it's a, it's a computer-aided tool, not a, not a fully computerized tool. Um, you can find lots of resources and ideas on, on the Auckland site which is um, physionproject.org, and this is pointing to the IUPS Physion Project, which is you know, really centered in, down in Auckland. Um, we have a website that's always out of date, like most websites, but um, you know, there's some pointers, there's some, there's some resources on our website, and there's also points of contact too, which may be more important. Um, and so with that, since it's just about six o'clock, I just wanna, Acknowledge the fact that this is a big project with lots of part, lots of players. Um, I showed you a tiny little thing about one little aspect of trying to put things together, but as you can imagine, you know one of the one of the advantages that you have here. I'm just thinking out loud. Is you know there's a huge advantage to having all of these experts from you know the best places. Um, for all of these particular things, you know, Auckland is you know 
Jim involved, et cetera, et cetera, Andrew. But there's a huge advantage to having a, a lot of people under one roof. So you can sort of herd the cats a little better, right? And, um, you know, it, it's, an, it's enough of a challenge, the plant physiome, which I'm calling it now, um, uh, on its own than trying to do this around the globe. But anyhow, some balance. I should thank the funding agencies, NIGMS, but also we, we, we have support from Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute as well. So thank you very much. ATP uh, um, free energy tension in muscle below which the muscle starts to fail or I mean is there uh, yeah. can you as that tension drops and as the energy physiology fails at some point presumably it's does it happen as some sort of a, a, almost like a like, like a critical point or a thresholding kind of thing perfect yeah um, it, it, I have, a good, I have a really nice picture of that. Yes and no. So, so when we, there, there, there is this sort of interesting critical, I, I skimmed over this. So what we're looking at here is the computed free energy at high work rate, okay? So doing some exercise in a, as a function of these metabolite pools, okay? And so what happens is, and this is what happens when you sort of move along the, um, um, progress towards heart failure, okay? But these are all individual animals. And you, you can sort of reduce total adenine nucleotide pool and total exchangeable phosphate pools and stay on this sort of contour, right? Until you can't anymore, and then you fall off that cliff, okay? And that cliff happens when the adenine nucleotide pool is about 30% reduced. And that's the reason why we've annotated that on this graph is because that's the sort of clinical level of end, what's observed in clinical level end stage heart failure. So that's kind of, you know, it's not a critical phenomenon if you're a physicist, you know, but it is a transition. And, um, and, and that's in terms of what these metabolite pools are. But if we look at then this um, sort of changes, say, changes in phosphate, it's more like a gradual kind of thing that happens, you know, or, or, and, and that's a sort of kinetic, kinetic thing rather than a thermodynamic phenomenon. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, nice talk. I have two questions specific. One is um, uh, in the plant system, in the mitochondria, we have a uh, Actually, the electron transfer chain, they have two systems. One is the normal way, another is the alternative. Okay. Alternative. Uh, is, that a, is that an alternative electron acceptor? Yeah. Do they have okay. the similar thing in the human, similar kind of thing in no. the human No, mitochondria? but lots of microbes have lots of alternate respiratory chains. But we need oxygen. Yeah. So is that, I think that's what you're asking. And I, yeah, that's, I, you're getting me outside of my... So, zone, so my question really is, uh, so there's only, if we have fixed amount of reducing power, NADH, the number of ATP generated through this mitochondria is the same. Is that right or not? In, 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 the, in the human uh, system. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so you have this um, substrate dependent, we call it the PO ratio. So that's um, ATP synthesized or phosphates, phosphorylations per oxygen atom, okay? And, and that is roughly constant, but it actually depends on, it has to do with, any, with, with NADH. I'm going to go back to my picture here. So um, there, there are substrates which generate, um, that, that feed right into complex two, okay? And fatty acids generate um, uh, FADH. And so if you're generating a lot of FADH, you're getting a lot less proton pumping per oxygen consumed. So, 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 the, if, so on fatty acids, it's not a big difference, but you can measure it's like about a 10% difference. So you have a lower PO ratio on, say, consuming palmitate versus consuming glucose. Okay. Second question, quick one. Uh, what's the condition make the phosphate levels drop? What's the what? 
what, what kind of situation will make the phosphate levels drop? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mean how, how do these metabolite pools change? We don't know exactly, but we do know that w what we think is it's driven by, by the adenine nucleotides. So, so adenine nucleotides are always kind of getting recycled, and um, so, so you have these sort of continuing hydrolysis that, that go on to make ADP, AMP, adenosine. Adenosine leaks out, but you also have these salvage pathways. And depending, and, and, and if, you're, if you're making a lot of AMP, okay, you, we think you're kind of tilting things towards the degradation. And, and, and we're trying to t target these degradation pathways and these salvage pathways pharmacologically. So if you look, if you go back and do some analysis on those meta metabolite pools, they all kind of go down together. And if you, and if you imagine that, it, that the driving one is the adenine nucleotide, then the other two pools op get optimized somehow to maintain hydrolysis potential. So it's one, it's one thought model. It's one model that works anyhow. It's not necessarily the right model. But we think that's the driving force. And then by some regulatory pathways that we don't know about, the others are achieve the right kind of numbers to work. Another question about the phosphate. Thinking very naively, one way that you could pull, that you could push phosphate down would be if you were phosphorylating glucose too rapidly. Mm. Uh, in the liver, you have this cycle, I think, of the uh, glucose phosphorylation and the well, phosphorylation. Is anything known, in the, particularly in the heart, about how you actually prevent over yeah. phosphorylation of the glucose? No, but there's some experiments that folks have done where they, where they feed hearts or, or other tissues too, deoxyglucose. And deoxyglucose then gets stuck. And then you, you, eventually, you eventually, yeah. And so there's, I don't know why people do those experiments, honestly. But, I mean, no, there's a reason. I just not, I'm just not, I'm not thinking of it. But we've looked at those data, so we can use those kind of data to try to get at the kinetics a, a little bit. And of course, what happens is it starts to, you, you know, if you ate a bunch of deoxyglucose, you'd probably fall over dead, yeah, at some point. Thank you for a, a very stimulating presentation. One thing I particularly enjoyed about it is you spent the entire time talking about what in the old days we used to call physiology. Now the, I'm a plant biologist. American plant biology in particular is pretty much obsessed with genes. And maybe there's reasons for that. And a lot of the things to do with plants involves genetic manipulation. and. So there's a, a large effort to characterize a lot of genes and all their interactions and the transcriptome, et cetera, et cetera. Vast amounts of data being generated. And it's not clear to me how that is all going to be integrated or used by multiscale mechanistic models. And you, you kind of mentioned human genes at the beginning and then never really got back to it. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah. So. I, I, I think you, you, you laid out the problem really well, and it's the same problem we're, we're dealing with. We, we do a lot of work with genetic models of hypertension. And when we, one of the things we started out, and one of the things we really failed at, was trying to make that genotype to phenotype connection with those genetic models. And I'm not sure how, how, what, what it's like in the plant world, but one of the big problems with the genetic models is just reproducibility. And we found we struggled a lot with trying to get the same phenotype in different laboratories from the same genetic models. And if you can't reproduce the phenotype, then you, you can't really get to the genotype to phenotype relationship. So that's one thing that we've, we're, we're still struggling with. But we use the genetic models to get at molecular pathways and, you know, un, 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 underneath that. Um, the, the way folks try to use models in, is they, they, in, in this way is they say, well, we have functional differences, and we have genotyped genetic strains, right? And we're going to look for SNPs that might be associated with those pathways, right? It hasn't, it hasn't really worked, OK? Um, the, one of the reasons I think it hasn't worked is because these kind of statistical approaches to statistical genetics require a really, really precise phenotype if you're going to do a GWAS kind of thing, right? And I think what we, what we hope we can do with the models is have much, much more precise phenotypes 
so that we can then start to make those, those inferences and at least start trying to draw those connections. But it's, you know, other than when you have real obvious single gene effects, it, complex diseases were still in early days, I think. Hi, thank you. A very interesting talk. Uh, so you talked a little bit about using these models to inform a treatment. Is there examples where you've used it to inform a clinical diagnosis? It, um, in, there, there are lots of examples in, in the literature, and there are lots of examples with our, our collaborators. And um, we, there's, there's one um, kind of common use for, for cardiovascular models in, 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 in that sense, and that is, has to do with biofluids modeling and, and looking at things like um, trying to plan surgeries. Okay? So that's sort of entered the, the era of maybe not quite st standard of care, but relatively common. Somebody has an aneurysm or somebody has uh, some other kind of um, repair that needs to be done, and you simulate the fluid dynamics, the hemodynamics, and you simulate you try to get at what's the optimal treatment, or you try to even ask the question of whether or not this aneurysm should be fixed or not, or whether it's going to be better to do it. In the cardiac side of things, folks like um, Andrew, who, uh, who's part of our team, and also Peter, have been using um, these, these patient-specific cardiac models to try to make retrospective predictions about certain kinds of therapies. One of the therapies that they've been looking at a lot is cardiac resynchronization therapy. And so what that is is people with some kind of, some kind of heart block, maybe a fibrillation or something, they, they, um, they burn away part of, the, part of the electrical conduction system and somehow magically it, the arrhythmia gets fixed. And you know, there are responders and there are non-responders. And then retrospectively, they've been going back and trying to then identify who are those responders and non-responders. And, and it seems to, it's really interesting, it actually seems to have to do with when, when the heart beat isn't, when the conduction system's not working right and things aren't beating at the right time, you get regions of the myocardium that do work and you've got other regions of the myocardium that do negative work and, or have work done on them. And that's because they're getting they're getting stretched at the wrong time, maybe when they have the calcium dumps. And it turns out that there's a correlation or some kind of relationship between the amount of negative work that's being done and whether or not the resynchronization is going to be useful. So now we're going back and looking at those same data and saying, well, can we now quantify what's happening in terms of, in terms of the, the mechanical work and, and then connect that to a ATP utilization and, and, and the energetics? So, what we're trying to move in the direction of what you're asking about. Thank you. One more question. Yeah. Um, I think that was one of my questions, but I have another question. Um, so, you know, we are here, we are, you are bringing a lot of work on multi-scale, and then we are also talking about plants and multi-scale models. So my question is that you could think of uh, multi-scale in two different ways. One is you're modeling individual models at different scales, and you're learning something from them versus an integrated model that runs simultaneously. So in the yes. case of the virtual physiological rat, like what that simultaneous running of multi-scale model has given you that could not have been obtained by studying things at an individual level? All right. Well, one, ex one example is, is what I just showed you in putting together the whole body heart failure model, for example, right? So we know we can make a prediction about, you know, a Crossbridge cycle and kinetics, right, uh, ATP-dependent kinetics. It's a totally different regime to think about the metabolic kinetics. But even putting those two things together, until we put it in the context of, it, of at least the beating heart, right, then, you know, we don't know how that, that's going to affect mechanical function at some sort of in, in, integrated level. And when we want to simulate a time scale of, say, very long time scales of, say, fluid handling, right, changes in blood volume, then we have to put together the, 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 the whole cardiovascular system, even in, maybe in some crude way, but in some way where we can simulate, um, you know, whole body solute and, and, and water handling so that we can look at venous, you know, we can actually get venous congestion, right? So that was an example, you know, some of the pieces are crude, but it's an example of, of doing something at 
you know, what's happening in, in a cell, in the myocardium, and what does that do to the whole organism at the level of a phenotype, which is the whole cardiovascular system. Yeah. Okay, well, let's thank Dr. Beard one more time.